putting this thing together with me tonight and uh, and being so helpful to us as uh, as we move forward on, on these developments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Moran, for those kind words. Um, we're going to get started very soon, but I first wanted to um, also note that we do have Councillor Liz Breeden's uh, face up here because we did want to um, just recognize her. I don't think she's here tonight, although someone jump in. I see someone from her staff, Pam. Mulaney, thank you so much for being here. I don't think the counselor's here, but she's been an incredible help um, to us in a number of ways, but including getting, getting the word out um, about this event. So just wanted to, um, to express our gratitude for that. And with that, I think we can get started. Um, so just some quick background on us, Charles River Watershed Association. Uh, folks are probably aware we've been around since 1965 when a group of residents decided they were fed up with how dirty the Charles River was and they didn't see their leaders uh, stepping up to do anything about it. So we've been uh, played a very central role in the cleanup of the Charles ever since then. And we use science advocacy and the law uh, to advocate for the river and improved water quality and habitat as well as uh, watershed lands. And that includes impacts from climate change, including heat, um, and flooding, which we'll be talking about tonight. We take a watershed scale view. So for folks who weren't aware, um, when, you, when the rain falls in any part of the Charles River watershed, even places like Holliston, where the river does not run through it, uh, the water eventually ends up in the Charles River. And that's how you define a watershed. It's 80 miles, over a million people live in the Charles River watershed. Uh, 35 cities and towns, 23 of which have uh, the river running through it. We are going to be focused on this particular section of the watershed here uh, tonight in the Alston in the Alston area. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dira. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. All right. So as Emily said, um, our watershed is pretty big and within this about 300 square miles of watershed, we actually face a number of challenges to keep the Charles River healthy. Urbanization within our watershed is pretty prevalent as you guys probably know. And as we face climate change and its impacts, CRWA really focuses on a number of topics and impacts related, um, related to development projects such as um, stormwater quantity, which um, can result in flooding and droughts stormwater quality, which really is um, looking at what ends up in the river from runoff, um, which is a really critical way for us to protect the health of the river and also the health of um, the public using the river. We also look at urban heat island impacts, which can be exacerbated or amplified by um, impervious cover, like pavement and concrete, or it can also be reduced um, with more vegetation and tree cover. And lastly, we also focus on equitable engagement within our education and advocacy work. And this includes connecting and prioritizing environmental justice communities and climate vulnerable populations. And this all really falls under the umbrella of climate resilience, which is what we're really talking about today. And um, within our watershed, like I said, we have had a lot of urbanization and as time has progressed, we have impacted and also changed the natural landscape of the earth. Um, we've also altered the water cycle. This graphic that you see here um, on the left shows you an undeveloped landscape. And so in an undeveloped landscape, when you receive your precipitation, about 50% of that will infiltrate into the ground. Um, about 40% of that will evapotranspirate back into the atmosphere from your trees and grass. And about 10% 10, 10 of that will end up as runoff and um, go into the rivers or streams. But when you have a developed landscape and you receive your precipitation with all impervious surfaces, um, only about 15% of that will end up infiltrated into the ground. Um, about 30% will evapotranspirate back into the atmosphere. And most of that will actually end up runoff um, as runoff into the river. So when you have a developed area, which um, typically has more impervious surfaces, it alters the natural hydrology and it can lead to increased runoff and pollution into our local water bodies. But we want to highlight that redevelopment um, um, offers a chance to improve um, previous development conditions, which is what we're seeing with the Harvard expansion. And um, we at CRWA think as we 
clear um, as we prepare for the future, we think it's critical to look at our past as well. So Boston, before it became the city hub that it is now, um, it was mostly marsh and wetland areas. And as you can see in this map of 1700 Boston, um, you see a lot of wetlands and floodplains surrounding the banks of the river. And as we urbanize, we start to see these wetlands um, disappear from the side of the rivers. It's filled up to create more land for humans. Um, and you see less of those natural streams. And when you fast forward to 100 more years um, and we become this fast paced urban city, when we, um, we see that we have more major highways and great landscape as well. And as you know and may have already experienced, climate change is coming to Boston. And according to the latest IPCC report in the Northeast, we are going, we are expecting to see increased temperatures, um, extreme precipitation, um, sea level rise, powerful hurricanes, and also a change in ice and snow in the area. Within the Charles River watershed, um, we're expected to see an increase in urban stormwater runoff, more combined sewer overflows, which will be covered later on in the um, presentation. We're also expecting to see flooding of critical infrastructure within our watershed, and also lower water quality with excess nutrients um, runoff into the rivers. And it's also important to note that while everybody in the region will feel the impacts of climate change, climate change will also lead to um, significant social disruption, which will not be felt equally across the population. And within our watershed, just under 20% um, of our land area are considered environmental justice or EJ communities, which you can see here in this map. And in Massachusetts, um, a neighborhood is considered an EJ community if the block groups, um, um, for, for example, if the block group's annual median household income is equal to or less than 65% of the statewide median, or if 25% or more of the residents identify as a race other than white, or if 25% or more of households have no one over the age of 14 who speaks English only or very well, which is considered English isolation. And using the Massachusetts 2020 EJ map viewer, we see that in Alston Brighton, um, it is made up of many EJ communities. In fact, almost all of Alston and Brighton are considered EJ communities. And historically, these EJ communities have not had the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards or even equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which they can live, learn, and work in. And there is often a correlation between minority income, English isolation, and climate vulnerable communities. So let's take a look at what makes a community member vulnerable. So a community member um, can become vulnerable to climate change when they are when they have higher exposure to climate-related impacts such as extreme heat, flooding from extreme weather events, and tick-borne um, diseases. And the people that who are um, who are typically exposed to these are outdoor workers, um, hobbyists who spend time outdoors, people experiencing homelessness, people living in floodplains, or people, um, or even people living on upper stories of buildings in urban areas, which can be especially hot in the summer as heat rises. And um, some people may have AC, some people may not, which will exacerbate that heat. Um, even if you have AC, some people can experience power outage, and that may also exacerbate the heat, um, heat effects. Another factor is your health vulnerabilities due to age. And so this includes the elderly, babies, and children. If you have a chronic or pre-existing medical condition, which may limit you um, to stay somewhere, you might not be able to move um, somewhere else for um, a specific reason related to your health. Um, and also lack of economic, social, and political resource can increase a person's risk from climate change and also lower their chances of recovery from impacts when they occur. So examples of this include if someone doesn't have a steady income or savings to allow them to relocate during an emergency or even access to emergency relief. Um, if someone doesn't have insurance for their house or their cars or renters, if someone doesn't even have family ties that they can rely for help. 
And so these are all um, different factors that can make a community member vulnerable. And as I mentioned before, climate, climate change impacts will be felt, um, especially in the city. Um, and one of those include urban heat effects, which will be felt everywhere in Boston. And then this map, um, in the same map of Halston and Brighton, um, you see where all the EJ communities are. And then when you look at this map from Climate Ready Boston, um, which shows you areas in the city which will experience um, moderate, high, or very high daytime land surface area, you see that between the two maps, there's um, pretty good overlap where that urban heat effect will take place and where the EJ communities are. So this is a great example highlighting how critical it is to address these effects of climate change. And additionally, uh, Massachusetts will also be experiencing more intense precipitation and runoff. And with the amount of precipitation surfaces we already have in our environment, we you know, should really expect in, like an intense stormwater flooding. And so on this map on the left here, it shows you the um, impervious surfaces in the Charles River watershed in gray. And you can see that there's more in the lower watershed where the city is um, as more of the natural hydrology in this area is altered. And then this map on the right shows you flood vulnerability within the watershed. And basically the biggest takeaway from this is that the darker um, colors in this map correlate with high vulnerability to flooding impacts. And you can see that the locations of the dark color on this map overlap with where you see impervious surfaces on the map on the left. And so this, is, um, this just shows another factor of um, our climate change impacts. And there are many flooding scenarios that are to be expected in the city of Boston. This is an example from the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. Of, on the left here is an example if you just have a thunderstorm um, with a 10-year storm event receiving 3.2 inches of rain, you will see some flooding. And on the right here, um, this is an example of if we get a nor'easter, which we have in the past already, um, for a 10-year storm event, and you will see an incredible amount of Alston Brighton that will get um, inundated with flood. And on top of that, as I mentioned from the IPCC report, we are also expected to see um, more hurricanes in the area. So this map from the Massachusetts Sea Level Rise and Coastal Flooding Viewer just shows you that if we were to get a category two hurricane in the area. Everywhere that is green is where we will expect to see flooding. And so as a summary, Boston will be receiving flooding in the future. Um, and aside from the flooding that can cause detrimental and fatal impacts to residents and communities, stormwater runoff can also um, cause pollution in our rivers. So in extreme events, stormwater can drain into the rivers um, via pipes or outfalls or simply straight into the river. And things that end up in the stormwater runoff include phosphorus and nitrogen from fertilizer use. Bacteria can also end up in the river, which can come from many sources, including pet waste. So if you don't dispose of your pet waste properly, um, it can end up in the river as bacteria, also from urban wildlife. But when you um, have phosphorus and nitrogen in, in the river, it can um, lead to cyano, cyanobacteria, which essentially is a blue-green algae bloom, um, and it's naturally occurring, but it can have um, big impacts on aquatic life. So it can cause death to fish, um, shellfish, invertebrates, and plants, simply um, by depriving the water of oxygen. Um, but it can also affect humans. Um, so it can cause a number of different symptoms, including headaches, vomiting, um, salivation, and, or, and also respiratory paralysis. So this is not just an aquatic um, concern, it's also a human health concern. And additionally, um, having excess nutrients in the water can also encourage invasive species to grow. And they can typically outgrow native species, which can change the natural ecology of the, of the ecosystem. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Jenny to kind of um, take over about the ERC. 
Great, thanks, Dara. So thinking about Lower Alston, as Dara discussed, a lot changed since the late 1700s. There's been a lot of development. There's been a lot of redevelopment recently, and now there's more new and redevelopment projects planned. Um, this neighborhood in Boston is basically bounded by the Charles River, which is why we're you know, paying so much attention to it as Charles River Watershed Association. It's, uh, you know, the river goes around about three sides, it's over two miles of river frontage. Um, according to a recent Boston Globe article, Harvard owns approximately a third of the land area in Alston, so there's a lot of land that can impact the river that's under the control of one entity. Um, there's been a lot of planning over the years that's dedicated to Beast land area. Some of it's been completed, some of it's being updated. Um, there's also some other major projects in the area that are related to the long-term vision and needs. So thinking about all of these together, um, you know, when major decisions are being made that affect the river, we're here to advocate for the river and those who value it. So we're paying close attention to redevelopment and new development projects. So thinking about the Enterprise Research Campus, um, phase A of the ERC, so I'm not gonna use the full terminology for the rest of this, I'm gonna call it the ERC, is undergoing um, two parallel review processes, one with the city and one with the state, and comments are due soon. We acknowledge that this phase of the ERC is part of the larger plan. So all of that big planning that I mentioned, and it's that um, the whole ERC framework is part of an even larger plan related to Alston thinking about Interstate 90 realignment and um, you know development all the way down the corridor. So we've heard there's many questions from the community about the details um, beyond what's available in the available plans. But tonight we are talking about the ERC and thinking about this opportunity to have an impact by commenting on what's in front of us. So part of our intent for this meeting is to hear from you all about your questions and ideas and concerns. So I'm gonna go through some of the technical stuff, but as um, if you have questions, please note them. We can get into more detail uh, during the end, the Q&A. So if you're not completely familiar with this project, the proposed project is located south of Western Avenue in the Alston neighborhood of Boston, right next to the Charles River. It's um, just south of the Harvard Business School location. And the project includes, so the map on the left shows sort of the, it's a figure from the filings and shows the approximate location of the site that we're talking about. And the figure on the right shows the project boundaries. So in purple or blue, excuse me, is the phase A that um, has been, you know, pretty specifically detailed in these filings. And then the phase B is outlined, oh, purple and then the blue, excuse me, I apologize. So. Big picture, the project um, is gonna have 9,000 square feet of mixed use development, including retail, residential, office lab, hotel, conference center, restaurant, and nearly three acres of new um, public streetscapes and some open space. So the phase A covers about 9.4 acres of the total um, planned development area, which is the larger ERC, which is a total of 14, a little over 14 acres. And I just wanna make sure people understand that this is not a Harvard campus building, this is a private development. So going back to Dira's discussion about our work and our review on, you know, as we are looking through the information for this project, we are focusing, looking at it through our lens, thinking about stormwater quantity, flooding and drought, stormwater quality, get, keeping pollutants from getting into the river, um, advocating for green space, tree canopy, and limited impervious cover because they relate to urban heat island effects as well as stormwater. And all of this with the mindset of equitably engaging um, minority income and English limited as well as climate vulnerable populations. So what I'm going to do is just talk about the project in the context of this review lens, um, what they're proposing, what we think about this work, and then we'll, we'll get into questions and answers. Just a note on the existing Kin site, I just wanna make sure people understand you know, the background of the existing site. So the, the site was previously developed completely. It had you know, storage facility, um, impervious area. It was basically 100% impervious. That's all been torn down. And now the site is sort of a staging ground um, and le it's less impervious currently, but basically the, the drainage on the site currently 
is not active. So there's no drainage system, nothing that gets stored, treated. There's no groundwater recharge. So it's really not contributing to significantly to flooding to the drain or to the drainage system. But so the project um, offers a great opportunity to make improvements to this area. And thinking about during construction, I know folks have um, lots of questions about this. There are actually many permits that the project has to obtain to manage the construction period pollution prevention and erosion controls. And they're listed here. I'm not gonna read them all. Um, many of them are mentioned in the filing. Some of them have question marks because they weren't clear in the filing. So we're you know, providing comments and input on that. But big picture, um, this first item, the stormwater pollution prevention plan or also called a SWIP is really gonna be the meat of the construction management related to stormwater during, um, during the construction period. And that will not come until later. That's typical for a project like this. Um, but it would, you know, it really details all the things they're doing to keep the runoff clean and manage where it's going, how they're going to dewater, prevent contamination from going into the river, prevent flooding, prevent soil from getting off site, um, keeping oil from going in the ground. So that's really um, important to pay attention to. Long term, the site is proposing to do um, quite a bit of stormwater management. So I'm going to talk about this verbally and try to point to some things. There's a lot um, here. The filings go through it in quite a bit of detail. So I, I don't want to separate stormwater quantity and quality, especially in this day and age, just thinking about the multitude of issues with a site like this that's so close to the river that has a lot of land area. Um, so the work that the, the stormwater management systems are proposed to simultaneously deal with the volume of runoff, the rate of runoff and the quality of runoff. And they're doing this in a number of ways. So Representative Moran mentioned green infrastructure and low impact development. And those terms are basically the same thing. Um, there's some nuances to the differences. EPA has sort of combined them and said, you know, these are basically the same thing, but low impact development is the bigger picture premise of pretend you have an undeveloped site and there's trees and maybe there's some hills is that you're going to work in the context of what's there and try to keep the natural features and also replicate natural features like um, you know wetlands or green spaces that you might be removing to put buildings on when you have a site like this that's completely disturbed it's really more into the low excuse me, the green infrastructure realm where you're adding back infrastructure that replicates the natural system. So green infrastructure is a whole range suite of things, um, but basically it's things that use plant or soil systems to replicate nature, even permeable surfaces like permeable pavement, permeable pavers that are allowing runoff when it hits them to go into the ground instead of just go off into the drainage system, um, even harvesting and reusing stormwater runoff, any kind of infiltration putting that back into the ground. Um, but so that's sort of the suite of green infrastructure. And this project is going to be, so Derek can point. Um, so let's start with, there's the bioretention basin, which is a basically a large soil bed planted with native non-invasive species. We advocate for drought, um, drought tolerant vegetation. It's gonna treat runoff, the plants uptake pollutants, the soil systems also filter pollutants. They help, oftentimes these systems help infiltrate runoff so they can capture it, hold it during big storm events, and then slowly put the, the clean water back in the ground. Um, that also is proposed to serve as an educational area. There's also um, proposed bio, bio infiltration cells, and those are along the roadways. And basically those are sort of smaller systems um, that are sort of boxes of plantings or trees and they have room for stormwater to get in. And again, do the same functionality. It's just a smaller scale than that large bioretention basin. Um, thinking about the gray infrastructure on site. So this map doesn't show all of the underground piping, right? So there's the catch basins, there's all the pipes, there's, um, you know, manholes. There's also gonna, they're proposing a storage tank, which is gonna hold water back to reduce peak runoff, help address flooding. And then there's a subsurface recharge system that's gonna capture runoff um, and put it back into the ground. 
so that there is a way for that helps reduce flooding, but um, and then the ground does help clean runoff, but not as well as these green practices. So the proposal here is a combination of gray and green infrastructure. Just moving on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about some of the actual regulatory requirements and um, specific numbers. I know there's a lot in this slide. Like I said, please take some notes um, if you want to get into technical details. And again, we're not the project designers. I'm not the designer, but I can talk about what I've read from the filings and um, see what questions you have. But there's a number of regulatory requirements the project's required to comply with. There are a number of city requirements. So there's the Boston Water and Sewer Commission site plan review. This is a whole suite of design standards for the drainage system. Um, there's the Boston Planning and Development Authority Smart Utilities Policy. There are two what are called total maximum daily loads, or they're like a pollution budget for the river to keep phosphorus and pathogens out of the river, and the project does have to address those. And then, like I mentioned, there's the construction period stormwater permit. Um, the project is going above and beyond in a number of ways, so this is a lot, and I apologize for those of you that are not into the technical details, but um, so the Boston Water and Sewer Commission requires the project to capture and manage 1.25 um, inches of precipitation. And the project is proposing to actively store and manage 1.5 additional inches. So that's over the volume that's required, um, the, the precipitation amount that's required. And that will help with reducing flooding in the area it will help reduce um, peak discharges of runoff to the river. So that's great. And because of that, it'll also, in the way they're proposing to do the bioretention, there's also larger size systems to help with water quality management. So like I mentioned, the total maximum daily loads and the pollution budget requirements, um, they're saying that they will be able to manage 64% of the phosphorus that's on the site and keep it from going into the river on an annual basis. However, we're still looking at whether that's in complete compliance with the TMDL. The project also will be complying with the Massachusetts Stormwater Management Standards and Handbook, which is basically a state guidance. It is typically used by conservation commissions, but it, uh, some, um, it also applies to many projects depending on local requirements, but what they've said is they're complying completely, not as a redevelopment project, but as a project, which is above and beyond. And if there's a new handbook that comes out, they're also going to comply with those standards. However, those standards, as um, they are written now, do not necessarily address climate change effectively. Um, they have said that they're gonna raise the first floor just to avoid flooding. Um, there's materials that are gonna have high solar reflectance. The, as I mentioned, the bioretention has an outdoor classroom component, which can be used by community members or nonprofits or whatnot to, to provide education. Um, there are also a few other things not on the slide, you know, looking at the coastal zone risk model and thinking about how they're gonna assess information. Like Dara was mentioning, there's all these different sources of flooding. But um, I'll talk a little bit later about some of our additional sort of questions and concerns as I wrap up. So if you can keep going, Dara, I did wanna talk a little bit about, so we've talked about the site itself, but um, we also wanna think about stormwater management in the, in the broader community. So this figure shows the approximate drainage catch sub watersheds or catchments. Basically, as Dara mentioned, you know, during development as houses were built and pavement was put down, all of the natural streams are put into culverts or pipes. So the water now, instead of flowing over the surface of land, is now underground, and there is a capacity limitation on those pipes. And so as, um, <clears throat> as we continue to think about the ERC, and we also have to think about how does the flooding in all of these neighborhoods, because Dara showed you some slides that had predicted flooding under climate change, but you know, localized stormwater flooding. How is that in, um, excuse me, the right word is, you know, how is that all integrated? How does this project site affect upstream and downstream flooding? So um, the Boston Water and Sewer Commission has a parallel project that I mentioned, and it's the North Alston Storm Drain Extension Project. 
And these photos are from the um, filing with the MEPA office that was put in back in January, February. The image on the left is showing the existing drainage system in the vicinity of the ERC, which it's not outlined. Uh, maybe, Jerry, you can kind of highlight where it is with the pointer. Thanks. So there are some you know, capacity issues and the, basically the system goes from a large pipe and then takes some very hard turns, it gets to a smaller pipe and then it goes back out into the river. And so the proposal by Boston Water and Sewer Commission is to reconfigure that piping to avoid that sort of um, constriction and put in a new outfall to the river and um, have you know, the system flow. And we still have many questions about where the existing flooding is, exactly how this will reduce the existing flooding and how that all fits together with the Enterprise Research Campus. And so one thing I did wanna to mention too on the stormwater system is new storm drains like the, the NASDAQ um, can't be combined with sewer. They have to be a separate storm drain system. So combined sewers are water plus uh, stormwater plus wastewater. So this, this diagram shows on the top what a combined sewer system is. So on the left under dry weather, you can see you know, sewage is going into the pipes and then it's going to the wastewater plant. When it rains on the right, the stormwater runoff goes into the system and now is combined with the sewage. And when there's a capacity restriction, it becomes a combined sewer overflow into the river. Um, there's, you know, this was how sewers used to be designed. The goal was to keep sewage flowing, not going into your house. Um, things have changed, but there still are a number of combined systems throughout Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, um, during 2021 alone, there were 40 combined sewer overflows into the Charles River, and we've had a very wet year, but we're going to have many more wet years if we continue on this path of climate change. Not all the sewers have been separated. There's a variety of reasons for that, but um, if you look at the bottom, you can understand the separated sewer system and how that um, separated stormwater sewer systems and how those work. Under those scenarios, your waste is always going to the wastewater plant. And then when it rains, your stormwater is going into the river out of a municipal separate storm sewer system or MS4 outfall. That water is still polluted with what's on the land surface. So like Dara was mentioning, you know, um, pet waste, uh, fertilizers, you know, trash, all of that gets into the river, but at least it's not um, sewage. And last, I'll just touch on the urban heat island effect. So we are, you know, we always are thinking about that long-term impact to our communities. And there aren't any formal regulatory requirements related to tree canopy or coverage, but in Boston on average, it's just over 25% of its land area has um, tree coverage. And that's from the city's recent um, tree canopy assessment. You can look that up online if you're interested. The project aims to reduce the heat island effect by planting trees throughout the site. It's estimated the tree canopy is about 1.4 acres of the site or about 10%. So not even hitting the 20, you know, the average in Boston. Um, I will note that the numbers vary throughout the filing. So we're gonna be commenting on that as well to get confirmation. And the uh, last thing I'll note is um, the, all the, the diagrams in the filings are illustrative and subject to change. So we are going to be get, seeking confirmation of these numbers for the long term. All right, we are at 645. Hopefully I'm not moving too fast, but I did want to summarize some of our remaining questions and concerns about how this project will affect the neighborhood, things we're still seeking to learn, and then we can talk more about what folks have to say or ask. So, you know, the site Stormwater management and the redevelopment is an improvement to existing conditions, um, but how much of an improvement? So we want to better understand how this project will mitigate flooding for those many potential storm events. How, you know, Dara talked about hurricanes and um, nor'easters and even just a small sort of standard precipitation event. Um, how is the system on site going to perform? How is the system in the neighborhood going to perform? How does the ERC affect the neighborhood? Um, where is that flooding in the neighborhood? How much is the ERC actually helping flooding and how much is the NASCAP 
solving these problems. So these are still some of our outstanding questions because flooding is certainly a big concern as we move forward um, in our future. The project is adding green space, but is it actually enough to mitigate urban heat island effects? Um, they're anticipating it will cover approximately 85% of the site with impervious surfaces. So those are the walkways and the roadways and the, the roofs. Um, there is mention of green roofs being installed, unclear if that's a firm design plan. So we're looking to understand more about what other opportunities there are for green space, how to further reduce impervious cover to help with urban heat island effects as well as flooding and water quality. We still are thinking about construction period impacts. And as I had mentioned, um, that really is a document that gets sorted out closer to construction, but we still are looking for some clarifications around the discharges of dewatering, which is the water that would be around a foundation. And when you have a formally, you know, transportation used site, there can be contaminants in groundwater. So we just want to avoid those going into the drainage system and um, into the river. And we are trying to understand if there's sufficient gray and green stormwater controls to protect and improve water quality in the river. As I mentioned, the project proponents are saying they can remove 64% um, of the annual phosphorus load to meet the total maximum daily load. And there are a variety of green infrastructure controls trying to understand though what more could be done and how, how um, the TMDL is specifically being met. We're also looking to understand more about how the pathogen TMDL will be met. So really just trying to keep the river usable, enjoyable, accessible to those that um, enjoy it for all its purposes. And as Jira had talked about too, all of our work is in an equity lens, just advocating that stakeholders are engaged. So that was a mouthful, huh? Um, I think Dira is gonna jump back in and we're gonna start to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much, Jenny. Um, so right now we're gonna open the floor to everyone that's attending. Um, we really wanna hear your thoughts on the Harvard expansion, what we presented, you know, what your thoughts and questions and comments are. And before we open it up to everyone, um, I'd like to just go over some discussion etiquette while we open up to the floor. Um, please, um, or select your hand, route, hand raise tool, sorry, to speak, which you will find at the bottom of your screen under reactions. You can just place, um, press raise hand and myself or Julia um, will um, keep tabs on who has questions. And while someone else is speaking, please keep your mic muted so that we can hear um, each other speak um, clearly. Um, there is quite a number of people who attended today. So as you're making your comments or questions, please be mindful and keep them brief so everyone has a chance um, to speak. And um, lastly, we know this is a very big project. Um, so as we are discussing, please be respectful um, of each other's comments and concerns. And so with that, I am going to open it up to anyone who has questions. And I'm going to stop sharing for now. See that Jen has raised her hand. Sorry, Jenny, can you, what is dewater? What is that? Sure. So dewatering is imagine you've dug a hole and the groundwater level is visible. Like let's say you dug a hole five feet deep and three feet down, you can see the water. And so what happens is when you're building a large, you know, doing a large construction site, you do have to dig very large holes. And when you're this close to the river, it is expected that groundwater is gonna be pretty high. It's almost gonna match the level of the river, just given the proximity of a site like this. So what you have to do is take the water out of the hole to pour concrete, to safely have um, workers in there and equipment in there. And that water can go into the sewer in some cases, depending on the contaminants into the drainage system, in some cases, depending on the contaminants and or into storage tanks to take off site or into some pretreatment system, which then goes into either the sewer or the drain. Does that answer it well enough, Jen? Yeah, that works for me. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 
we did um, just give out a lot of information. So I assume people are mulling over what we just said. Um, please take your time. But um, I see someone else's hand Hi. raised. Oh, Mark. Hi, Jenny and Dira. It's Mark Hanley from Harvard. Um, I just wanted to appreciate really deeply um, the presentation you just made. I wanted to thank Representative Moran and Jen for helping bring this together tonight. Um, that is, your presentation completely blew me away tonight. There are a couple of small issues that we can talk about later that are just fact, that are just simple, um, small things. But Jenny, your presentation was brilliant. Um, and Dira, I just, I wanna thank you guys because this has been such a hard topic to delve into, especially over Zoom, especially during COVID. Um, so Emily, um, on behalf of Harvard and Rep Moran on behalf of Harvard, um, I wanna thank you guys for bringing this together. I also wanna recognize that at least earlier, I saw John Sullivan on the call. Um, John is uh, the chief engineer at Boston Water and Sewer. And in the discussion about the NASDEP, which is the storm drain, it's, it's been incredibly hard to talk about the Tishman Spire proposal the Harvard Enterprise Research Campus where the Tishman Spire proposal is a part of it. And then the, the larger storm drain issue, which is a regional storm drain that um, in the future condition would serve 160 or so acres. Um, you, you know, Boston Water and Sewer is Harvard's partner. Um, Harvard is fully funding that project. And um, we can talk more um, about how that relationship has worked, but it was probably 15 years ago where that deal was struck and Harvard is committed to fulfilling that commitment to the city that it will fully fund this infrastructure. Um, and when the project's done, uh, the infrastructure will, will be owned and maintained and operated by Boston Water and Sewer. So um, beyond that, I, I just wanna tell people that Harvard is here and we're listening. I appreciate everyone that's here. I see Tim McHale, the chairman of the task force. I see Ed, I see Tony Desidora. Um, and a lot of my other uh, you know, folks on the task force and folks in the neighborhood. So thank you. If there are Harvard questions, I'm a resource for you. You can email me, mark underscore handley at harvard.edu. Um, and any questions we hear tonight, we will be very diligent in following up on if I can offer a guidance or an answer right away. Thank, thank you very, very much for convening this meeting. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for the kind words and the the respectful dialogue that we're 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 engaged in. If I could just say one other thing, and then I promise I'll start listening and stop talking. We are committed to bringing this NASDAQ project to fruition. And it's not just Harvard's commitment to fully fund the project. It's the biggest storm drain project of all time in the city of Boston. We've committed additionally to a public benefit to support the legislation that is necessary to, to get the pipe underneath the river road and outfall into the river. John Sullivan, who I, I don't, he and I uh, co-hosted meetings pre-COVID to talk about what that benefit might be. It's a commitment that is there. It's a commitment that is separate from all of the other regulatory process. And I wanna make it clear that Harvard is gonna abide by that. Um, time is of the essence for a lot of the reasons, Jenny, that you talked about here. Um, but that's something that's been put on the table very clearly. Um, this is regional infrastructure. It's not associated with any one project. And this is an incredible example of where a Harvard commitment that was made a long time ago, it is now possible to bring this through the ERC and into the river, the storm drain. So we're enthusiastic about it. We're committed to hearing feedback and listening. And ultimately um, that commitment is hand in hand because it requires state legislation because it will access underground the state parkland underneath the river road and it will have to outfall into the river in order to work. Uh, that we're committed to doing that. So that's another element of how Harvard's at the table. 
Great, thanks so much for clarifying that, Mark. Um, I see two hands that are raised. Um, Barbara, why don't you go first? Hi, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really clear and helped me understand a lot of issues and hopefully the rest of the community. Um, one, um, one thing I'm wondering how CRWA handles is, you know, that there's so much development going on and it's, it's is this parcel by parcel process that is, you know, the BPDA does. And, and, but in this case, it's up and down Western Ave. Um, you know, as the Globe said, and Harvard owns a third of the land. So uh, one of the issues we're having in trying to shape our comments is we're coming, you know, the comments are specifically about phase A of um, the ERC, but, you know, there's so much else going on. We're not sure how to approach that, you know, like in, in terms of green space, for example, you know, we know what phase A has, but we don't know the rest of the picture. So how do you handle that kind of approach um, when thinking about this whole area from Watertown to, to the Cambridge area of Western Ave and North Austin. Thank you. Barbara, that's a really, no, that's a great question. I'm going to start and I think Dara and Emily will jump in. So I think about this, I, just so you guys know, you know, I started here in early, early February. So I've been around just under six months with Charles River and I'm, you know, still struggling to grasp the magnitude of redevelopment projects in Alston. And the thing I've been working on is just mapping it, trying to understand what projects are where, what stage are they in, um, what's going on, where, you know, we're thinking about the river, right? So we're thinking about where they discharge, um, which outfalls they go to, no one flooding concerns. So just thinking about it visually is the first step from my perspective, because um, then you can think about cumulative impacts and sort of like the, the holistic piece with respect to tree canopy and and water quality, water quantity, I mean, right, thinking about flooding. So that's the technical piece from my perspective and an approach that we're working on, but I'm sure Emily and Dara have other things they wanna contribute. I'll just jump in to say again, that was a great question and that folks should realize that it is a watershed and that the importance of remembering that is that things that happen upstream affect you in Boston. So we're doing work all along the watershed and there's something called the Charles River Natural Valley Storage Area. And even though I grew up in Newton, lived here most of my life, I'd never heard of it, but it was land set aside over 8,000 acres set aside um, in the 70s and 80s to protect lower communities after Hurricane Connie and Diane in the 1950s. So this is an Army Corps project that is protecting all of us. Um, and yet most of us have never heard of it. So much of the work that we're doing is all over the watershed and we're looking at really big scale um, ideas so that um, as the precipitation increases, because as horrible as the rain was this past year, it's only gonna be more in the future that we can be smart about it. And um, folks are probably aware that we've been a broken record about Widet Circle in Boston, how we think that that is er an area that actually should be restored to uh, a natural area um, instead of leaving it as impervious surface to, to protect the surrounding areas. And I think a, and a, a big part of our work is just like we were doing here tonight is to help people understand that the way things were 400 years ago, it's wonderful that we, we now have a built environment that allows us to have modern lives, but it's almost like, you know, Jason with the mask, it's, it, it's coming back. The nature is, the water is coming back and we need to be proactive to deal with it. So when we have an opportunity uh, with this project and Harvard is obviously putting a lot of money into it. And so as, as you heard us say, we think there's a lot of opportunity here to make it better than it is. Um, we, wanna, we wanna weigh in, but uh, we do need to be looking um, at the larger scale, not, not even just Harvard's land, but even, but even wider. And we are trying to do that. And I'll add a little bit before we have Bruce um, add his comments. Um, as you may know, CRWA isn't that big. We're not like, we're not made of a hundred people. And so we really prioritize what we spend our time in when we think about developments in the area. And that also really relies on the expertise that we have. Um, and so we have, you know, the number of expertise that we have, but the really big um, addition to what we do that's really helpful is our collaboration, which is kind of what today is for. Um, we're hearing your thoughts, you're hearing our thoughts, and it's really to kind of gather 
um, all of our opinions and comments and think about this project and what's happening in Boston more holistically, which I think is really important. And so any opportunity, which I know Barbara, you have also connected me with a lot of members um, in the Harvard Olson community, that's one of the ways that we really do our outreach. And um, when we think about how we, um, how we um, tackle some of the development projects in the area. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Bruce. Bruce, Bruce Klein. Hi, I, I really appreciate what you're doing tonight. And uh, as somebody that uses the river a lot, I definitely want to see it preserved. Um, with all the construction, I know there's a great deal of concern about stormwater and stormwater runoff, which has gotten considerably worse incidentally in the past few years. Um, my question, I guess it is, would be what about groundwater? Uh, the foundations, the pipes, everything that's going to have to be added is going to disturb that groundwater level in an area that used to be swampland. Uh, how is that change going to be mitigated, if at all? And what effect will a change of the groundwater flow have on the future river itself? This is actually a really good question, Bruce, and it's not a simple answer from my perspective, from like a technical perspective. So it's sort of a few different pieces, right? I mean, as we have more precipitation, more intense precipitation, the groundwater levels will become saturated, right? So become higher. Um, what will be done to mitigate the groundwater levels during development, I don't know. And I think this is something that's important for us to include in our comments on these filings, because it's not something we've touched on previously and would definitely like to understand more. Um, I don't have a full answer for you, I'm gonna be honest. Okay. It's really, it's a really important thought, right? Because when you have higher groundwater, you have water in your basement. And then what do you do with that water? You pump it out of your basement into the storm drain system. And what if the storm drain system doesn't have room for it? Or what if you're out of power? Um, these are really important questions. And the developments need to consider those. And that's a you know bigger climate management question too in, in all of our geography, not just Alston. I don't know if Emily or Dira have anything else to add on that. I feel like I haven't answered your question fully, but I'm not sure I can. Yeah, it's um, it's an excellent question. Um, my other my other side gig is I also serve as a city councilor in Newton, and so we've been. Um, this is something that um, has been wrestled with historically. It's like, oh yeah, you get a sump pump. Oh yeah, you just you know you just pump it out. That may not work in the future with this increased level of precipitation. So I think it's another example where our, our rules and regulations have not caught up to climate change. I mean, just to give you an example, FEMA maps that single, whether it's a single family home or the I-90 project, they're relying on FEMA maps, which do not take climate change into account. Yet, hopefully they will, but decisions are being made today uh, based on rainfall patterns of the past. So there really is a big disconnect between what we know about what's coming and yet what our rules are right now. Um, and so I think groundwater is a good example of that. Great, thanks so much, Bruce, for that question. Um, and I'll pass it off to Tim. Hello, everybody. And uh, thanks to the staff of the CWRA for, for that great educational presentation. I learned a lot and I'm, uh, I know the community did too and is grateful. Um, Emily, your reference to Jason and the mask was not lost on me. Thank you very much. Yep, you're excited. showing your age. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and I'm glad that John Sullivan, did I just see his hand come up? Because I, this could be a, a good question for John. Um, that regarding the NASDAQ and the, the community is trying to understand the, the breadth and scope of the NASDAQ and what is the catchment area? What are the, what are the various catchment areas? Because I think it's a phased thing, you know, by area, by year, by volume. And, uh, 
and the sort of that's the catch. And then some basic engineering of you know the size of the pipe and why it needs to be so large. And uh, so that would be my question: Can we define, or has CWRA digested that information, the different catchment areas over the different years, and by volume? So Tim, that is still a question outstanding with us as well. We've commented uh, during the NEPA process and are following the permitting processes for that project and um, still are hoping that Boston Water and Sewer at Harvard can share more information with us and more technical information. Ah, so you haven't seen it. Uh huh. And can Mark Hanley or John Sullivan react to that? Uh, John Sullivan, I. We, we have shown this at a couple of meetings, what the tributary areas are, the catchment areas. We weren't killing you with all the numbers, but we can give you all the numbers, how okay. big they are. Um, we back in 2010, anticipating work, <clears throat> went on to North Harvard Street and put in a 72 inch pipe because <clears throat> we had already done all those counts. So we knew we were gonna start off with a 72. Um, as we did further work, it worked its way up to, you know, we had a 72 around the science center. It's worked itself up to an 84. And as climate change keeps going, one would question why isn't it going to be 120 inch. But that's what we're looking at. It's a design storm of 10 years. Um, Jeannie, I guess, I guess we'll send you a bunch of numbers if you want to look at numbers. Engineers get so excited about numbers. We'll take care of that. Yes, we do. Um, one quick one, if I could just jump on the groundwater issue. 90% of the storms that we have had since 1948, 90% have been less than an inch. So that means when we had paving lots before where the water would rain in the lot, put it in the catch basin right out to the river, the groundwater never got replenished. Since about 1995, we have been making every new building capture the first inch. And now it's up to an inch and a quarter if it's a big building, but capture the first inch and bleed it back into the groundwater. We were trying to, since, since 2000 before it got really great, we've been trying to restore groundwater. And so it slowly will make its way to the river. So the river is constantly being replenished, but more importantly, nature can then clean it. This dirty stormwater runoff we have that we used to just take, put in a pipe and shoot out to the river. We now make it go into the ground and nature takes care of it. And mostly it's taking care of both the bacteria issues and it's taking care of the phosphorus issues. The all new developments in the city are required to do this. So anybody that builds impervious surfaces in the city or rehabs is required to take that first inch or inch and a quarter, depending on how big your buildings are, put it in the ground and replenish the groundwater. So that's a plus for the river. It's a plus for the water quality of the river. And it, it takes helps us out a bit. The problem is we have these six inch rainstorms. So we just took care of the first inch and a quarter. Yay us. What are you gonna do with the rest of this water? That's why we need big pipes. We need big pipes to take the remaining water because it can't get in the ground anymore. It's all full. And we got to transport that out to the river. So that's a simplistic way of why this big pipe is going. 90% of the time, that's not gonna be taking water. Now on your streets, this is all development that has occurred since 1900 in your neighborhood. We haven't got in there and changed those systems yet. Those are still piped directly to the river. Slowly but surely, we want to go onto the streets, putting in green infrastructure in the streets, putting in new tree canopies. Uh, along with that, that'll be our green infrastructure method. But it's a process. This doesn't happen overnight. Plus, it's extremely expensive. And of course, you know where we get our money from, Tim? Every month you get a little reminder from us, you know, please contribute. So it's something you have to lay out on long term. We have the plan for the streets. All new development is already contributing now. And this big particular pipe was planned early on, back in the 1900s, it was planned for a big pipe out to the river. They just never built it. So that's, that, that's a quick synopsis. I don't think it's totally complete. It doesn't have all the numbers in it, but we have all the numbers. Thanks, Great, thanks so much for clarifying that.
And I just want to jump in and, and, uh, and express my gratitude and CRWA's gratitude for a long partnership with John Sullivan, who we actually gave an award my first year at CRWA several years ago at our annual gala um, for our long partnership. Um, the city of Boston is very fortunate to have John Sullivan in his position, and hopefully he will stick around for a while because he knows where all the bodies are buried. And I don't mean that literally. I just mean where <laughs> things need to happen uh, to, be, uh, to be managing water for the future for the city. Thanks, Emily. Um, and Liza? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for hosting this. This is really informative and really valuable. I want to just thank, uh, you know, everyone at CRWA and um, Mark Henley and John Sullivan. Um, so my main concern is just that we need to really prioritize the community stakeholders, right? Who are the people who are living in these places? Who are the people who are really gonna be, you know, seeing this development day after day, you know, week after week? Who are the people who are gonna be, you know, dealing with this development um, if something bad does happen? Like if there, if there is a huge storm and if this negatively impacts the land and people's ability to cope with uh, sea level rise and with uh, intense storms. So uh, I just wanna, you know, stress that community engagement piece, which is why this is so important. Sorry about the background noise, one second. Um, and then I don't know if uh, we've taken into account like ecosystem biodiversity and uh, human safety. Like, are those, you know, things that we're discussing as well? Because I'm hearing a lot about climate resilience, which is really important, but like, yeah, I was wondering like how will ecosystems be impacted? Like, did, did we discuss like, uh, you know, an animals that could be impacted or um, how this could disrupt ecosystems and also to like how this can impact human safety? So those, those are my questions, I guess, um, for Mark Hanley and John Sullivan, yeah. John, I defer to you, but sorry, is it Elizabeth? Yes. Thank you. I would want to make sure to talk about the water quality benefits. There's a there's a element of the proposed storm drain. It's a sediment retention box that will be installed under the ground to the immediate south of the of the science center that just opened. The sediment retention box will clean the sediments from about a hundred acres of water emanating from the residential neighborhood that will go through that, that box. And it will contribute significantly to the cleanliness of the water that's coming through and reaching the river, both in terms of reducing the amount of suspended solids that are in the, in the, in the water coming through, it'll clean the water, and it will also have a huge impact on the amount of phosphorus that ends up reaching the river because a lot of that phosphorus is in the grit and sediment that, the, the, that it cleans. There are other practices that are being employed as well to reduce the total amount of pollution, phosphorus, and sediment that are coming through the system. But it's really important to do that there, right south of science, uh, because that's all the water that's emanating from again, the residential neighborhood. Um, and it will be cleaned dramatically and be much cleaner when it reaches the river than how it is now. So I think that has a lot to do with the ecosystem question. Yeah, I think that helps, yeah. I guess, is there anyone though on your team like who's, uh, you know, specifically looking at, you know, the way animals and ecosystems will be impacted by this? Or is that just sort of, because I think like now, especially with, you know, so much uh, extinction, like we're in like the sixth great extinction, the sixth mass extinctions, so, like that's something that we need to be taking into consideration, I think, in a project like this. So I don't know. I will, this is Jenny from Charles River, I will chime in. So on the Enterprise Research Campus itself, you know, the, those green infrastructure practices that do have planting do actually create habitat because they're surface practices. Um, not necessarily for any specific species, but they're, you know, pollinator habitat and they can provide bird and other a variety of habitat. And um, also those green infrastructure practices do remove pollution on site as well. So those are those are good things. Um, I don't know if Dira or Emily has other things to add on this topic. 
Um, I don't think so. I think really, um, I know there have been discussion in some of the public meetings that um, Harvard and EPA have held um, regarding you know, animals in the area, wildlife in the area, and I assume that's something that we can all follow with. Um, and yeah, um, and so I also see two more hands raised up, um, so I'm going to pass it to you, Ed. Uh, yes, um, I have a lot of concerns, one which Bruce brought up. Um, with these buildings going up, the water is at an eight foot level right now below the round here. The question is when the buildings go up, where does that water go? Is it coming into our neighborhood? I have recently seen some dampness in my cellar, which quite frankly, I've never seen before. Uh, this has occurred both in the dry and in the um, recent floods. So I think we need to know the answer to that question, which I, I know you guys uh, said you weren't sure about right now. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, Mark just brought up something about the sentiment. Where is that, Mark, exactly? And part of the entire NASDAQ being installed is that to the immediate south of the science complex, which has recently been opened, but we're only partially because of COVID. There's a street there. It's a new street, it's called Science Drive. To the okay. south of Science Drive, which is also the area that you enter into if you go beyond the fence that was at the end of Arena Park, same area. That's where the sediment retention device is gonna be installed underneath the ground. And it's gonna catch the sediment from emanating from the upstream neighborhood, which is, the majority of the residential neighborhood that it serves, it's about a hundred acres. Um, and it is engineered to catch sediment up to a very, very small uh, particulate fineness. It's gonna clean that water and it's gonna take the phosphorus out of the water that when it ends up phosphorus in the river, you get environmental issues downstream in the river, uh, an issue that between BWSC Water and Sewer in CWRA is deeply understood on this call by people more knowledgeable than I. But that sediment retention device is a, is a big box that will be maintained regularly um, to make sure that it continuously cleans the water. Okay, another question. Uh, recently, um, Harvard has put in uh, a 72 inch pipe, which is an extension of the Cambridge Street pipe. It appears from there that it's going over to the 84 inch pipe. I'm told that that area where they, where they just started, which is just off the turnpike, uh, that is supposed to be some kind of a retention for the Cambridge Street. I don't quite understand. Uh, I haven't got an answer to that yet. Uh, and then we also had some flooding, as you know, Mark, at Hague and Rotterdam, which was a temporary fix at the time, which has come back, obviously. And it took quite a while to drain down this time. And you're unable to pump it out as quickly as you did before. What is the problem there now? I'm told that the 84 inch will cure it, but I don't see how. And if you knew it was there and it was temporary, why didn't you attach it to the 84 inch while you were putting it in? You knew it flooded. So that's another question. Um, and then I want to go to that first slide if I might, if, if Mark doesn't want to answer first. And I can answer your questions quickly and I'm happy to follow up with written responses. 
you mentioned a number of areas where parts of the storm drain have been installed. The first area you mentioned is underneath Rena Park. That's the extension of a 72 inch hole that was put there when John Sullivan, who talked about this earlier, um, upgraded the north to south storm drain on North Harvard Street. When Harvard excavated for Rena Park, this is beside Ray Malone Park behind the Hone and Alston Library. Harvard paid for and installed a 72 inch portion of the pipe, which exists today and serves that upstream neighborhood. And if you look at the storm drain map that was shown earlier, you can see that that upsized 72 inch portion was able to successfully connect with John Sullivan's pipe in North Harvard Street, and it is active and used today. It creates a lot more room for storm water because it's so much bigger than the pipe that was there previously but it still bottlenecks when it skips across Western Avenue. Um, and so the bottleneck is the hindrance of the entire system. There are two other areas where storm drain has been installed, but is not active currently. The next one, if we're going from the west to the east toward the river, is crossing Rotterdam Street. It was necessary to get work that was related to other utilities out of the way in order for that section across Rotterdam Street to be installed. And as the street was opened up for that utility work, the timing was right to put that small stub of the future storm drain underneath the street in order that when the, when the project is permitted, when state legislation is in place that we can actually connect this thing to the river, that Rotterdam Street doesn't need to be permanent, it's completely shut down then. The last section of pipe that is being installed along with some other work is adjacent to the I-90 offering. And the purpose of that is again, to, to take advantage of the timing and the necessity to install that piece of the pipe first in order to connect fully to the full system. And in order to get that complex work with the DOT off-ramp out of the way and taken care of. So that work is underway, but that pipe, just like the stub beneath Rotterdam is not actively in use and it, it doesn't interconnect with the upstream system until the pipe is allowed to come through all the way. Okay. He, Related to is, the- Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Mark. Hague Street flooding. There were huge issues. I think it was the spring of 17 that you and I and some other of your neighbors were really challenged to get the water out of Hague Street. Some of the flooding has to do with the enormous amount of rain that we've experienced. Ultimately, all of that water will feed into, all of that area will interconnect with the NASDAQ. But for now, the portions, it, it, but, but for now, the connection's not there. And we're looking forward to being able to clear that street and to fix that. I think it's gotten worse because of the inordinate amount of rain and the fact that the ground is saturated there. We have been in with cameras and VACs to suck out that system and try to restore functionality. And something has happened over the course of the past month or so that we've seen problems there. But that certainly will be served by the, um, by the NASDAQ. It's just okay. that on that side of the street, it doesn't yet connect to the river. So there's pieces in that aren't working for the system yet and aren't serving the neighborhood or Harvard. Whereas the part underneath Rena Park was able to connect with John Sullivan's system as he described earlier. It's in use now, but the bottleneck is on the other side or it's across Western Avenue. Um, okay, here's the problem, Mark. You are giving my construction committee and uh, whoever's on the other meetings, everything piecemeal. How do you expect us to understand the whole if you're giving us just pieces. I would not approve this pipe if you're not going to tell us the whole story. And why are you delaying it? That, that makes me think, well, what are they really doing? You see, you, you have to give the whole in order for us to understand what's going on. I find it out in pieces. I don't know whether Mr. Sullivan 
is finding out in pieces too. How do you expect the community to back you up to complete this pipe if we don't understand the entire process? It leaves a bit of deception and that is not acceptable to me as a construction committee chairman. So you're going to have to come up with an explanation of the entire process, not a piece of the process, not another piece of the process. How do we even know you're going to finish it? At this point, I don't know. So I've got a meeting tomorrow night. If you have more explanation, you can certainly um, talk about it, or maybe you and Mr. Sullivan can talk about it. But now I have to get back to the other thing at hand here. Um, the first slide, uh, could you put it up again, please? Yes, the very first slide, which... Yeah, I think it was uh, with the different, uh, what, what do you, where do you put the water? No, next. Some flooding maps. It showed, let me see. So this is a map of um, if you if we have a thunderstorm and also a nor'easter in the area. No, go go back. I think it was maybe the third slide that you put up, showing that it was yellow and no. One more, keep going. Where is it? This is our EJ communities. The slides, the slides, slides from the Boston Water and Sewer that show the tributary. You have the biotech thing there. And... Oh, it must be further down then, because these are all of our. The bioretention? Yeah, you had it's a number of things in there. Yeah, so one the of the slides. Okay. Yeah, hold it right there. Biofiltration cells. Could you go a little bit deeper into that? And the storage tanks, I don't know where they are or where they're planned to be or if they're even there yet. The and you, just made Jenny region, like, you just made Jenny very happy. You asked an engineer to go into more detail. Well, uh, I think Jenny and I are gonna be talking further. <laughs> The stormwater recharge add. system, what is that? Um, and how does it work? And the bioretention basin, I don't understand any of it. I'm sorry, but sure. I'm not an engineer. I'm just a curious person being educated. So unfortunately, I don't have images to show right now. Um, the I think that would be a good thing for us to add and share with the group with some example visuals so that you could see more. But um, so let's start with the bioretention cells, which aren't, and pardon me, I'm not, the, again, like I said before, we're not the project designers and I'm doing my best to work from, what is this, um, 2,400 pages of information from the project proponent. So the bioretention infiltration cells are, a, my understanding along the roadway, the new roadways that will go in. And this relates to requirements from the city of Boston to put green infrastructure in along the roadways, if I am not incorrect. And so what it is, is imagine you're standing on a sidewalk and the sidewalk's ADA compliance so is wide. And imagine, you know, you've seen like, um, like a street tree, right? When you are just on a walk, there's a street tree and there's sort of a cutout in the sidewalk. Um, so this might be looking almost just like that, except it might have different plantings. It might not be a big tree. And it's also going to be designed so that just a small amount of runoff from stormwater runoff from the area just goes into that system. So it's just soil and plants. It's going to be along the roadway and in the sidewalk. And the reason it's called bio infiltration is the bio piece is about the plant. The bio implies there's going to be like pollution uptake by the planting. So um, whether it's a tree or a bush or some grasses or whatnot, 
And then the infiltration implies that, like John Sullivan was talking about and we were talking about earlier, that it's going to put some of that runoff back into the ground, right? That, that first 1.25 inches is helping address that requirement on the site. So visually, I hope that explains what that might look like if you were standing on a street. Yep. That, okay. So hopefully that one's um, good. Let's, you know what, I'm gonna stand the bioretentions and while I'm going, um, just take a quick look at the filing and see if I can get the storage tank. So the bioretention basin is, imagine you're standing near a pond. You know how there's like wetlands plants and there's an area where there isn't water, you know, you wouldn't go swimming on it or you wouldn't put your boat into it, but it's like, there's plants and there's wetland species and there's maybe sometimes there's water in it when it rains and there's a lot of water, but then most of the time it's sort of dry and it has, um, it has a lot of plants. And in this case, you know, we're advocating, like we said, for um, eco, uh, excuse me, drought resistant species as well as natural sort of native species to the area. So what it, you're looking at effectively a garden that when it rains heavily, so the bio is the garden piece again, and then retention is holding the water. So the water will fill up in this system, and I'm simplifying this, and hopefully I have it right against the filings. I'm sure I'll hear from Mark and Tishman Fire if I don't, but um, so the, the retention piece is retaining the water. So when it rains, right, think about your basement, right? If it rains and there's a ton of rainfall coming down, it's all gonna go run off really quickly. And what this is doing is retaining that water, giving it a space to flood on the site and then slowly leach out into the drainage system through like an overflow pipe. So there might be a pipe where it runs off and goes into an overflow. Um, it, this may also do some infiltration, I can't recall. So um, basically if you were standing next to it though, it looked like a garden that sometimes is wet, like a wetland. Did that help, Ed? Oh, yeah. That Much sense? simpler. Than <laughs> You're making it simple and understandable. And that I okay. really appreciate. So, the stormwater recharge system, I believe, is underground. And somebody stop me if I'm saying this wrong. I'm trying to look through this. Um, one sec. I'm just getting to the cross section. I believe it's. Yeah, so the stormwater recharge chambers are underground. So you wouldn't see them if you were standing there. And the best way to imagine them is, you know, like what an arch looks like. Um, they're often arched. It's like, instead of a whole pipe, it's like half a pipe. And what they do is there's a series of layers of gravel and um, sort of like stone that has voids. And then you put these arches on top of it. And the arches are like big, long, air, you know, volume that you can put water into. So there wouldn't always be water in there, but when it rains really hard, instead of the water going right into the river, right into a basement, you know, right into the storm drain, it goes there first. And what it does is it captures it. So it's underground, it's dark, but then it slowly puts the water back into the ground by just containing it. And there's typically a place too, where there's a pipe where if it got you know, really, really heavy precipitation, um, it would let the water out just so that it doesn't overflow and ruin everything. So I don't know if that helps visualize. Um, I can't give Dira instructions to look up a photo of this, but it's basically a, a half a pipe, a bunch of half a pipes next to each other and they, um, and they hold water. I understand that. Good enough? Thank you. Yep. Okay. And then the storage tank is, I believe, I'm just looking at this, um, I'm not sure if the storage tank is underground. I apologize, there's a lot in here, but um, it's just a big tank to hold water. It might be underground, I, I believe it is. And it's just a big empty structure that's when it rains, it's gonna just hold that water and then put it into other places, whether it goes into the recharge system or just into the drainage system, but it's helping reduce the amount of water and how much water comes off the site. So it's just a big concrete tank. Okay. That you may or may not see. That makes sense. 
Thanks so much for okay. explaining that, Jenny. I mean, and in um, in respect to everyone that's you know that's also here in time, we're kind of running out a little bit. Um, I'm going to move for, um, forward with some other people who have raised their hands, but I want to remind people that we will be sending out a survey for you to fill out if you have any more questions or comments that may not be addressed during this presentation. Definitely feel free to include it in there, and we will. Um, hopefully be able to answer right back to you. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Priscilla. Here, do you want to take this? Hello, can, hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. I'm sorry, I'm in my car. Um, I am uh, Ed Katamori's neighbor on Wyndham Street, and um, I have a couple of things that I wanted to just clarify and ask, ask if I have it correct in my brain. Um, I'd heard at a recent construction mitigation meeting that if the NASDEP does not actually succeed in getting connected to the river, that it still will have a function as a holding tank. And um, because the water can go in it right now, it's just not flowing into the river yet because that connection hasn't been made. And my question is, is this actually more ecologically sound because that water will then leach into the soil and get, a, you know, it'll, you know, raise up the, the groundwater and get cleaned by the earth before it eventually filters into the river. So would that actually be preferable from an environmental point of view to use that NASDEP as it is now um, as a holding tank for the water? And my guess is that, that it, it's more ecologically sound for that amount of water, but that if it were actually a running pipe, it would service a whole lot more water. So that 10 year storm would actually be able to be taken care of without flooding my basement. Whereas if we just used it as a holding tank, maybe it would only hold a five year storm or something like that. So I don't know, but I, I wondered if, if people would wanna come on, comment on that. And then I'll just uh, say the second part of my thing and then I can mute again, which is that it's very difficult for the neighborhood to assess these plans without having a more, more detail about the framework for the whole development. And, you know, especially when we're talking about green space and, and making sure that that we're, you know, that the whole area will have a sufficient amount of green space. What I suspect based on the framework plans I've seen so far is that the park, that the nice wide park with lots of, of green activation, that that's that the it of the entire, um, you know, that's the biggest green space that we're ever gonna see in this, in this whole, parcel and i would like to encourage harvard to work with the developers work with tishman shoot for that 25 26 percent that that is you know um of permeable uh green space that is typical of the rest of boston we really we need this area to be green we need it to defend the river and to avoid the heat island um, that we already have. So I just wanna beg Harvard to please consider increasing the amount of green space and share those plans with us so that we can see, um, we can see where it's going. Thank you, sorry for talking so much. No, thanks so much, Priscilla. Um, I'm gonna hand it off first to Jenny if you wanna answer the first half of Priscilla's um, question and if the second half and then Mark, if you have any other comments to make. Yeah, so Priscilla, that's a good question about just having storage versus a flowing pipe. And you are correct that storage would not manage nearly the amount of runoff that a flowing pipe would. Um, ecologically, of course, a discharge, I mean, you know, a new discharge to the river is always a concern, but there's a number of, like I mentioned, extensive permitting processes for a pipe like this that require pollutant removal, um, you know, peak flow mitigation, erosion mitigation, construction period um, mitigation. So it, it 
these are concerns that we've had and we did state those in our letter to um, the MEPA office during the Boston Water and Sewer Commission's notification on the project. Um, so I'm happy to share that with folks. It's on our website under advocacy if you wanna read it, but certainly we are, you know, we do have concerns about a runoff like that. I will say from a flood mitigation perspective, I don't see a system that is this size storing sufficient water to long-term mitigate flooding concerns. And maybe others that are on here, or Mark has a different perspective, but um, it's just not large enough. And when you see large flood mitigation projects in New York City, even the one that's down by, um, you know, uh, what's it called? UMass Boston is, I mean, these are huge, these are enormous pipes. Even Somerville's putting in some serious flood mitigation. So um, that, is a very good point. And um, I don't think, what were you gonna say, Dara, about turning over the second part of the question? Yeah, if Mark oh, wait, Before you questions. turn over the park, the park piece. Um, so there is, in one of the presentations that we saw from the project proponent, a slide that shows a diagram of the green space corridor and emphasizes five sort of discrete open space ideas. Um, we can share that as well with folks. It's, but we are advocating, Charles River is advocating as part of these projects and as part of the framework for more than just meeting Boston's average tree canopy and more vegetation, more green space, less impervious cover. It's part of our, our core work, so. Jenny, I'm in full agreement with what you said. And Ed, this is the answer. That was a better answer to your question than I provided earlier. And if it is possible to go to the, just the depiction of the layout of the NASDEP and the existing um, in future drainage basins. I want to assure you, Ed, that where the NASDEP has been installed already, whether it was back in 2015-16 or recently across Rotterdam or on the I-90 off-ramp, the, the storm drain is exactly where, it's, where it has been depicted the entire time. The difference between being part of the active system under Rena Park versus only providing what has been referred to as storage. What Jenny just said is what I was trying to talk through earlier and I didn't do a very good job. But if you look at, um, if, if you look at the picture on the left, the portion of the NASDEP that is in, it came in with Rena Park is right at first where it says 72 inches. And as you can see, because this is on the left, the existing drainage, that piece of pipe is being used currently. So it provides the free flowing um, drainage that Jenny just described. If you look at the future extension, this graphic is years old now, and this graphic is exactly where the pipe is being installed and wants to be installed. Nothing has changed from the layout. But the two other stubs that I described, bridging right across Rotterdam Street, a very small piece, and adjacent to the I-90 off-ramp, those parts are part of the future extension. And they don't create the opportunity for a free-flowing system until they outfall into the river and interconnect with the 72-inch line. So the word I was struggling for earlier was storage. They do provide that because they're empty pipes that aren't interconnected, um, but they don't provide the opportunity for the water to flow through it in the way that the 72 inch under Rena Park does. And I'm happy to show you a graphic that better illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. Um, but exactly what you see here is where the pipe wants to be. And the urgency and the, 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 the issue is that we cannot touch the state parkland until that is allowed. We cannot touch the state parkland until that is allowed through legislation. Great, thanks so much for so so Hopefully, okay. sorry, Dara, go ahead. Nope, go ahead, you're gonna say the same thing I was. Yeah, I was just gonna thank um, Mark for answering, clarifying that, and Priscilla for your question. Um, and I see Barbara, you also have your hand up. Do you have another question or comment for us? Um, yeah, just first of all, one request. I love the maps that you showed. So if you can share any of those mapping tools, if they're interactive, that would be fantastic. Um, they were so helpful. 
Um, and then secondly, going back to this larger picture that we're struggling with on the task force as well that Priscilla talked about, um, you know, who is going to do like a larger North Alston, more comprehensive climate ad adaptation strategy? Um, is that something CRWA can do? Is that something that John Sullivan and his group will do? Is that something we need to uh, request? It's just how do we get this, you know, big picture addressed? Well, we won't speak for John Sullivan. It does seem like something that he may already be, you know, have be undertaking. Um, we, um, we're a small nonprofit, so we do things as we're able. Um, <laughs> Quite frankly, we do. This is all unfunded. What we're doing now. This is something that we're. Can we doing. get you a few million dollars to it? <laughs> yeah. So this is not. Um, so to then expand that. Um, but having said that, uh, there there are a lot more sources of funding for climate resilience work, and in fact, thanks to the state, we are doing. A, we've just completed a flood model for the upper and middle watersheds, and now we're going to be. Um, uh, looking at various solutions and how much uh, water the, that those will control. So, um, you know, a lot of on the bright side, a lot of your elected and appointed leaders understand um, more and more what's at stake here. So certainly we would be happy to be uh, part of any um, process to help bring in more data so that the community can better understand um, the implications of future development. If I could jump in there, Emily, we are a part of the city of Boston. We're not we're not part of the city of Boston. But we're part of their climate adaptation of uh, the futuristic look of what's happening. The Boston Environment Department runs the climate, all the climate issues. They they work with the Parks Department, they work with the Environment Department Conservation Commission, and they work with us. So we're as looking at our areas very carefully. We know what we need to do because we're under consent order to remove phosphorus. So we keep pushing them hard. Um, Right now, they're heavily involved with sea level rise and, and keeping the harbor under control. So, and they're just so big, they're only so big also. So if you really want to get that push in on North Alston, I think a, a, a push to the environment department, of course, who knows what it'll look like tomorrow. We have a, uh, a prior election and we'll see how we go. But that's really where we need to concentrate. The environment department is the key and they're the umbrella for the whole city, all segments jump in. And we've been actively doing ours and we'll work wherever they want to head us next. We work with them. We're working over the Arboretum. We're working over in Hyde Park. We're working on the Sea Level Rock, working in North Austin. And, you know, we've even gone so far as we've televised all the sewers and drains in the neighborhood there. And next year, you get to enjoy us digging up some streets and lining some pipes. So we'll, we'll be out. We're trying to do what we can do. But the tree canopy is huge. So trees will help us with heat islands and trees will help us take water out of the ground for pollution control so we need to work with them very closely and public works on that issue yeah and i can just i mean i'm imagining a sort of neighborhood-wide green infrastructure strategy as well um you know so anyway but thank you uh, thanks so much for your barbara Wait, before, dear, before you move on, Barbara, um, Charles River Watershed actually did do a green infrastructure assessment for the neighborhood in Alston. We can share okay. that reference with you. And there's also, okay. as John mentioned, you know, the city has been doing all sorts of climate resilience planning, and there's a number of documents available online. So just making sure folks on this meeting have those references is definitely something Charles River can do is just to share those resources. So we will um, email out a resources sheet, if that's okay with everyone. I'm committing to something without asking Emily and Dira, but I think that would be a great idea. So we'll sh you know, share the information from this presentation, the slides, and a resources sheet so you all have more um, to see. Thanks. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, so we are only a couple minutes away from hitting 8 o'clock. So we have a couple more slides um, to that we want to share with you. So um, Liza, I see you have your hand up, but um, Again, we will be sending out a survey that you can add your um, additional comments and concerns in. So let me just share my screen one more time. As Jenny mentioned, we've um, summarized some of the um, resources that we've used during this presentation, which um, I will share with everyone after this um, alongside the survey that will go out. Oops. Uh, and just also a little 
summary and pointing you to the direct um, direction, here are some links that you also receive um, just where you can submit your comments in regards to the ERC and the projects. And then lastly, this Saturday, Jenny and I will be in person at um, the Charles View community. Um, we are going to be um, they're in person to meet and talk um, and discuss with any of the community members who want to meet us in person. Um, rain or shine, and um, apparently Jenny told me that it might be raining, we will still be there. So hopefully we will see you guys in your rain jackets and rain boots. Um, and lastly, we just want to thank you all for um, coming today, um, listening to our presentation, asking really great questions and being respectful to one another in this um, discussion. And with that, here are some ways that you can connect with us on social media. You can reach us by email and you can also sign up to our newsletter to get um, any updates on things that we're doing within the watershed. And um, on the being in person, you know, all the things we heard tonight are great for us to hear and we will look into a number of your questions. So if you do come in person, we will have more thoughts on those specifics. Thank you so much. It's really helpful. Great, thanks so much. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your Monday night. I hope we didn't steal too much of your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gira, were you or Julia gonna end the meeting? Yes. <laughs>